Good morning, everyone. Uh, so before I go on to my presentation today, uh, don't concentrate on my ears. I'll explain them later. You can concentrate on my presentation. But before that, my good friend uh, from App Machine, Seabrand, uh, did something really fantastic to, um, yesterday morning. He told the crowd to stand up and greet the neighbor next to you. Introduce yourself and, um, and just say hello so you get to meet more new people. So stand up, stand up. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds to introduce yourself to the people surrounding you, okay? Ready, start. Shake hands, make new friends. And also promise each other you go to the after party today. Okay, 30 seconds is up. All right, guys. <laughs> Want to hear about my ears? <laughs> Uh-oh. I started something very unpredictable. <laughs> very true. Listen! Thank you. I promise I won't bore you. OK. All right, guys. Thanks so much. We can shake hands later, too. All right. So good morning. My name is Kei Shimada. And I've had the pleasure of um, speaking at the Next Web in Amsterdam. It was a, it was a fantastic event. and. Um, Boris, Patrick, and the TNW team have been so nice to invite me to Sao Paulo uh, for this event. It's actually my first time in South America, and I'm already enjoying it. I didn't know it was this cold. When you're in Japan, you think of Brazil with everybody in a bikini or a swimsuit, so yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe I was wrong. Okay, so um, I come from Japan. I speak English because I was born and raised in the U.S. And why bother me, uh, why bother listen to me at the next web? There, there's a reason. I travel the world giving presentations about Japan. Brazil is actually my 34th country. And... Um, I'm getting more and more invitations because I'm getting exposure. But I'm, talk I'm here to talk about a country where we have a homogenous society, but it's also known for innovation. Now, we're not short-tempered people. We tend to grasp innovation in the long term. So anything that we build, it's based on long-term vision. And I do believe that what I'll show you today is actually pretty interesting. It might be an indicator for you, every one of you, for what's to come. Because we've learned that long-term uh, vision actually pays off. For instance, if we look at mobile, look at this calendar. It starts from the top. Mobile internet, mobile email, camera phone, app store, real tones, Wi-Fi on mobile, QR codes. These are a lot of things that you see on your phone these days. But actually happened in Japan first. It's not only the functions and the technology that really makes sense. You have to build an economy or an ecosystem in order to, for people to grasp the technology and use it inside and out. That's why in Japan, since 2004, we've had our version of NFC default on all our feature phones, not our iPhones or Androids, because they were not around in 2004, to swipe, on a, uh, to swipe at the turnstile to get on a train, board a plane, 
buy a Coca-Cola at a vending machine, check into your hotel without going to the front, and also turn on a motorcycle. Well, that's an experiment that's going on. We don't have a motorcycle that is NFC enabled yet, but it's something that you may see, I don't know, maybe next year, two, three years down the road. Even McDonald's, of course you have McDonald's here, but if you come to Japan, you get a different experience. People swipe their phones to make payments, but also they swipe their phones to redeem a coupon. Big deal. But for enterprises, it actually matters. For instance, 2 a.m., Big Mac, dead center of Tokyo. McDonald's know it's unhealthy. They won't tell me so. But they could secretly push me a coupon for a green salad the next morning. CRM. It's not just the tap and go, but it's a way of engaging with your clients, your consumers, to understand their behavior. And NFC is just the enabling technology behind it. By the way, how many of you have come to Japan before? For those of you, how many of you think it's a crazy place? <laughs> That's 100%. <laughs> Oops. There we go. I've heard that the Brazilians love TV. Is that true? I see a lot of nods, okay. The Japanese people also love TV too. But in a small household, you seldom get privacy. It's one of the reasons that digital te television has been very big in Japan too. This little small screen, you get more privacy and you can see whatever broadcast is pushed to your phone in your little private world. This is a feature phone, but we've had digital broadcast since 2006, enabled for mobile. And it's also default on most of the Android phone, uh, phones that are produced in Japan too. As I mentioned, there's a lot of technology that is on the phone today. But unless you create a habit loop, people will get bored with the functions, the technology, and won't use the product or service. How many of you have read this book called The Power of Habit? Right. Not, not a lot of you, but it's a fantastic book. It's a, written by uh, a person called Chris Duhigg. And it essentially walks you through why people get this craving, this subconscious craving of certain things. And I think with long-term vision, you could create this habit loop with any kind of product or service that you would want to push to your uh, potential co consumers or clients. It works. I was at the Grow Conference in Vancouver two weeks ago, and there was a person on stage who's dissecting Facebook and Instagram and why people have a habit of going back to the service and using it over and over again. Of course, there are different kind of functions that get you addicted to these services, but then again, it's the secret sauce, the secret formula that makes your product or service successful. And in Japan, mobile was the only device that allowed you to access internet at a very cheap rate and get access fast wherever you are. One of the reasons that we've added a lot of functions to mobile was because of that. 
but the mobile carriers work together with uh, the content providers, service providers, to produce this habit loop of people having, having people come back to their services over and over again. That's why mobile in Japan is extremely large. The value-added service market is over 7.3 billion US. Advertising, 1.2 billion US. And mobile commerce, people buy stuff on mobile like crazy. I don't understand. I don't buy jeans by looking at a little thumbnail on my phone, but still, you get a better offer on mobile. People understand more about the product because a lot of information is on mobile. And it's the habit loop of going to your phone for all these kinds of services that makes the market so big. All right. So who thinks Japan is, ah, different from the rest of the world? Oh, not a lot of you. OK. Ah, you could be honest. I won't bite. We actually love the iPhone. When it was introduced in 2008, people were skeptic about it. It didn't have NFC, it didn't have digital broadcast, and people were like, ah, something from the United States. But people started to understand that there was another value there. Up until the iPhone came out, there was never a chance for an individual to make a mobile content product or service for the mobile phone as an app and sell it on the phone or on mobile internet because you always had to go through the mobile carrier. This opened up a lot of opportunities for individual in, uh, developers or people who have never engaged with mobile before. The iPhone actually was the best-selling handset for 2012 in Japan. This is unheard of. And we also have our version of the Android phones. And it's really popular. Even my grandma, who's 94, has a senior phone based on Android 2. Not that she uses other functionalities other than making a call to myself. We also love Western services. This place called Shibuya, we have a crossing where there's several thousands of people who cross at the same time in under two minutes. It's a crazy play, and it's also one of the most checked in places on the earth. We also rewrote history on August 2nd, August 2nd, by tweeting over 140,000 times in one second. There was an anime called Castle in the Sky by Hayao Miyazaki. I'm not sure how familiar you are with um, Japanese anime. But there's this, there's this iconic moment, I'm not going to give it away, but there was this iconic moment where the characters say this chant. And there were 140,000 people who chanted at the same time on Twitter. I think this is going to be on the Guinness World, um, Book of World Records. We also love Pinterest. A lot of Japanese companies are looking towards the Western world for new types of innovation and starting to learn too. So Rakuten, which is the largest commerce company in Japan, has a large investment in Pinterest. Pinterest, of course, is gaining a lot of traction in Japan, too. So from my eyes, what's around the corner in terms of innovation? What else is new? How many of you are in the advertising sector? All right. So this is a bus in Vancouver that I uh, shot. It's, um, it's a wraparound advertising. But I, if you look at the future of wraparound advertising around vehicles, 
this may give you a little glimpse of what you can expect. Energy conservation is very, very vital. Energy in the form of mobility may save, may save in the environment and lives eventually. Recognition. How many of you know augmented reality? AR. Good. Oh, this was not augmented reality. Augmented reality is the next one. Recognition. This is facial recognition. There's a vending machine, not only one, but hundreds, that are placed in the train stations of Japan. It shows you a display, a digital display, of the beverages that are available to you. For instance, I walk up to a vending machine on a hot day, I look very tired. It will recognize me, my gender, my age group, and then would recommend me beverages that I would potentially like. It's built on a proprietary algorithm, and it would, for instance, like push me Coca-Cola, tea, coffee, maybe mineral water. It would be different if it were a female that walks up. Maybe they would be recommended orange juice, tea, and maybe soda. Facial recognition is another technology that sort of like customizes recommendation for each and every one of you. Not sure if this is going to reach Sao Paulo in next year, but something maybe that might be of interest for uh, some of you. Now, augmented reality. This is this augmented reality called Smart AR by Sony. Maybe some of you have seen this, but it recognizes the angle of the surface. So you could see that water is dripping off the surface of a table. So augmented reality is not just overlaying digital information over the real world. This is the next generation of augmented reality. And this is actually done on an experiment on one of the Sony Xperia phones. It's not available yet, but this is just around the corner. Imagine how you combine this with your imagination. That's another good proposal that will make you stand out from your competitors. Big data. Talked about 311. I'm going to show you a video clip of Tokyo on the day of the disaster. Take a look at the clock on the bottom right. 2.47 in the afternoon is the time when we were hit by the earthquake. Watch.
So the center is, of course, Tokyo Center. And the rings around it represent the highways and the trade lines. So it's about 8 o'clock. You could see massive amounts of light coming into the city. And the more bright it is, the more dense it is. So everybody's settling down in their offices now. So you can see that the lights there are moving, but they have settled down somewhat. Now we're past 1 p.m. Watch all the activity go dark. This is the first time ever we've been, we've been able to visualize an impact of people's activities and behaviors on a day of a disaster. You can see that all the dots are moving very slowly. They're moving slowly because people are walking, they're on cars, but they're facing a lot of congestion. But they're flowing outwards, going back to their homes to, to go back to their loved ones. Maybe, maybe rendezvousing with their friends. 1 p.m., I mean 1 a.m., you see that the lights are flowing outwards a little more faster. This is when the train lines became, uh, become, uh, they came back into service. And by 6 a.m. the next morning, a lot of the trains, train lines were, of course, not on schedule, but they were running to carry people home. My company, Dentsu, and my team I'm part of the innovation team called uh, the Future Communications Department. We're using mobile GPS data, which is anonymous, in opt-in. And we're taking that data and putting it into a system or a service which allows people to understand people's behaviors in accordance to location, date, and time. It's extremely interesting because we're not basing our analytic tools on theory or formulas. It's the first time ever we're using live GPS signals to provide clients with access to real people's behaviors. It's not only us. There's also an opportunity for you to grasp this kind of opportunity. Okay, I love this quote from Albert Einstein. He said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Well, the Japanese people have a communication problem because a lot of people don't speak English. A lot of people are introverts, unless they go out drinking heavily. So our team concentrated on coming up with the service or product around nonverbal communication. This is a na napkin concept which eventually turned into this. So this is a device which measures my brainwave activity and shows whether I'm focused or relaxed. I'm not this Japanese insane guy with cat ears on just for the fun of it. This is actually a device where we wanted to see whether the general public would be interested in buying products like these based on brainwave activity. We've sold over 70,000 of these worldwide. And it was also selected as one of the top 50 innovations of 2011 by Time magazine. But we didn't stop there. What if we use our brain activities to, for instance, tap into content? I always have this problem of encountering new music. But what if we could have Music find you. Watch this. Miko, music inspiration from your subconsciousness. Miko frees the user from having to select songs and artists and allows users to encounter new music just by wearing a device. The Miko system is made up of two parts the Miko headphone and the Miko app for iPhone. The Miko headphone detects brain waves through the sensor on your forehead. 
The Miko app then automatically analyzes the user's condition of the brain and searches for music that best matches from the Miko database and plays the selection that fits the user's mood. The mood is shown on the indicator of the Miko headphone. When the user is focused, when user is in drowsy and stressed, Miko provides a new experience which we call music serendipity by detecting the user's subconsciousness through their brain waves. Miko by NeuroWare. How many of you want a device like this? Good. Okay, now this is the last part of my presentation, rich media. How many of you use these services? YouTube, Vine, Instagram. I know a lot of you guys engage with this, but this is around like motion videos, you know. It's painstaking to make, heavy to upload, but it's interesting. Everything is moving toward motion pictures. But I feel that there's something that we could do around photos. We actually made a service called Pixtune. It's, it'll be introduced in about three weeks. We're starting off with the iPhone. Um, but we said to ourselves, why can't we make our photos a little more interesting? How many of you can associate your photo memories with some kind of song that was you know, a big hit back then? All right. So what we did was, we made a service where the timestamp on your photo would go and grab hit songs from the iTunes database. This will be available mid-September. Sorry, that was a little kind of promotion that I had to do. But I hope you're interested. So I hope I didn't bore you. This is my two-year-old uh, two son. Gets bored very vividly. And so if you have any questions about these or any of the services that I introduced today, let me know. I'll be in the speaker lounge. And remember, Japan is about innovation. Don't forget about us. Reach out. And obrigado. Thanks, man. <laughs>